stood and spoke with such boldness in verse 19. The Bible said that the Jews sent the priests and the Levites from Jerusalem to ask them, Who are you? You were talking about this Jesus. Talking about the miracles. And talking about the blinded eyes. It's going to be open to you. You're talking about he that is to come. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? I think our lives ought to be such a witness in this earth that somebody ought to seek after us and ask them, who are you? It ought not to be no questions who we are, wherever we are. Somebody ought to know who we are. Look at the person next to you and say, who are you? Who, who are you when nobody is looking? Who are you when you're by yourself? Who are you? does not flinch when he's asked who he is. Sometimes we can become embarrassed when people ask us who we are. But John was not embarrassed. He says, if you want to know who I am, I'm glad you asked. He says, I'm a voice. I am a voice. The wilderness. Surely the wilderness is the last place that you would expect to hear a voice in the wilderness. Somewhere out of the sand and the wind and the singing silence, one finds himself called John beneath the searing sun and the serene skies eating his organic food. John felt sure that he had heard the call of God. I just want to know, is there any saints, are there any saints in here that know without a shadow of doubt that you have heard the voice of God? Yes, sir! Yes, sir! John addressed entrenched evil in high places and in low places. The world around him seemed to have lost touch with sanity. Religion had split up into warring fractions. On one side, you had the Pharisees teaching a morality that nobody could even live. On the other side, you had the sad museums uh, that were making the church so simple, a simple place of collection and distribution, distribution of money. On the other side, you had the, the grim zealots who were determined to root out everything. There's some folk that just kill everything, just can't do this, can't do that. They don't want to root out everything in the name of God. In John's view, the people seem to have made God's world a world of a dangerous place in which to live. And John was concerned about pollution. Not just the pollution of the air, not just the pollution of water, but he was concerned about the pollution of doctrine. You know, you know, brother preachers, we have to be careful now because with this world of relativity, we have to be careful that we do not soften the gospel, that we do not compromise the gospel, that we do not give in to weakness just to become popular. When I hear this doctrine, Brother Bishop, that we are no longer under the law. Bothers me, it bothers me because I, I, I'm concerned that, that they are that they are pushing us too far. You know, you're no longer under the law, but under grace. Dear God, uh, dear uh, 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 one of the writers said that, that we don't want to make the grace of God cheap. It, it, it's, it's, so, it's so crazy right now until people can do anything and still be saved. They can still talk about anybody and talk any kind of way and still be saved. I, I, I'm, I'm afraid of that because I believe the Bible says that there is a difference between the holy and unholy. Uh, if, you, if, if you have the Holy Ghost, Somewhere in your life, you want to stop cussing. I know that's right. I know that's right. I know that's right. 
Sanctify yourself. Anybody listening to me? Sanctify yourself and the very Father of peace will sanctify you home. I'm a little concerned when they say we all serve the same God. Because I believe in the sanctified power of the Holy Ghost, God, who's in heaven. A Christian is enabled to live a sanctified and holy life in this present world. How many of you still believe that? The commentator suggests that John may have been at the point of giving up on organized religion until he heard from God. John has studied the doings of the people under Moses and he began to compare what people were doing under Moses and what people were doing in his day. John was somewhat like the little boy who concealed a cap pistol in his pocket before he went to church and waiting until the pastor got in the middle of his sermon and the little boy pulled out his pop pistol. Pop, pop, pop! We can imagine the reaction of the congregation as everybody seemed to jump about two feet off the seat. The father grabbed the boy by the arm, began to take him through the church and back on the back pew just as he was going out the door, the old lady stood up and said, Dad, don't take the boy out. Don't take him out. Said that boy scared more hell out of folk. <laughs> Today than the preacher has in the last 10 years. <laughs> John, the fact that people just that way. He had not a regular ordination. John had no pulpit. He had no academic gown and no choir. He was not a reverend doctor. He was just plain old John. Honest and angry. How many of you know change don't come until you finally get angry? All right then. And that's why the Bible said you can be angry and sin. Now, you got to get angry enough. And John got so angry until he took dead aim at, at the personal political dishonesty. Got angry and greed and got angry over sin that he saw that was spreading and ruining everywhere. All kinds of people came to sit by the banks of Jordan to listen to John. The curious, the hostile, and the hopeful came. The Roman soldiers and their Jewish collaborators came. The conservative Sadducees and the liberal uh, Pharisees came. The rage in people of the caves and the intelligence of the university came. People with endless questions and empty lives came to listen to what John had to say. Carl Jott once wrote about one third of my case, the people that I deal with, are suffering not from clinical or definable neurosis, uh, but for some senseless and emptiness of life. People suffer when they are empty of life. Uh, you are used to praying with me. They're unable to understand themselves, and because they are unable to understand themselves, they cannot live happily with themselves. When John stopped to catch his breath, people began to ask him critical questions. John, who are you? Are you the Messiah? Of course, there are critical questions. Uh, their critical questions was political, uh, and they were waiting for an answer. John's message. Uh, had gotten him a lot of influence. And so the local politicians wanted to know, who is that man? If you are not the Messiah, maybe you are Elijah. And if you're not Elijah, who are 
pocket. Maybe you are just the prophet and want to know who in the world you are. Once people know who we are, the next question they want to know is, what do you want? Who are you and what do you want? John did not back up when they asked him who he was. He says, I am a voice in the wilderness. Well, what do you want? He said, I'm glad you asked. John said, repent. All right. I know it sounds cynical now. It sounds even strange in the church because we don't preach about repentance. We preach about the blessing plan, but nobody wants to preach about repentance. We preach about God about to blow your mind. But before your mind get blown, maybe your heart needs to be changed. Everybody want to preach the hype message and, and the boy message and what did he preach? I'm talking about critical questions and perilous times. People want to know who is the church. Is the church still really the church? Is there still any power in the church? Can you still get healed when you come to church? than to repent for the bishop. They, they, they listen, listen, I'm just going to pray for you. Huh, huh, I'm the hand. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to go my way and you go your way. That's not repenting. Well, I'm sorry. I said I'm sorry. That's not done with it. That's not repentance. But if I hurt your feelings, I'm sorry, but I ain't Mr. Nine asleep. That's not repentance. 